Some leading Christians have said that evolution has no effect on the Christian faith. Can evolution be blended with the Bible? What would that look like? Today on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name is Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Now this week we're talking about theistic evolution and how that affects Christianity. Right. That's our topic on Creation Magazine Live this week. Theistic evolution, by the way, is the idea that God used evolution to create. Right. So um, he basically gave the universe a kickstart and then uh, let it do its thing and uh, uh, or, or some others might believe that God zapped in a few mutations along the way to make right. things come out the way that he he uh, thought they should. Um, Francis Collins is, uh, is a well-known well uh, geneticist, and he's the head, the founder of Biologos, a theistic evolutionary organization. And he said this, being outside of nature, God is also outside of space and time. Hence, at the moment of the creation of the universe, God could also have activated evolution with full knowledge of how it would turn out, perhaps even including our having this conversation. The idea that he could both foresee the future and also give us spirit and free will to carry out our own desires becomes entirely acceptable. Well, uh, the huge theological problem, of course, is death before sin. Right. Right from yep. the beginning, right? Yep. In, in a review of the book called The Adam Quest, uh, the reviewer makes some points regarding theistic evolution. He says, this point exposes the most significant problem with evolutionary creationism as a whole. The Bible. <laughs> I'd agree. <laughs> By requiring pain and death in the beginning, evolution tells a different story of the world than the Bible does. And only recently have evolutionary creationists begun to take this challenge with full seriousness. Whether their alternative readings of Genesis merit serious consideration is another matter. Stafford firmly believes in the authority of Scripture, but he isn't convinced the young earth creationist view is the right one. If he had nothing else to go on, he would accept a young earth interpretation of Genesis. Wow, cool. So the author has admitted that theistic evolution uh, has nothing to do with what the words of Scripture actually say. Right. It's kind of interesting. Nothing else but, to go on. You yeah, just have but, to say that God created. That these interpretations ultimately come because of what some in the scientific community are saying. Right. Now, yeah. he, he also says he firmly believes in the authority of Scripture. But what exactly does the authority of Scripture mean then, right? Yes. I mean, there was a time when the majority of scientists believed in a young earth and creation by God. A couple hundred right. years ago, the yep. majority of scientists would have said that. Yep. Uh, so if, if the majority of scientists uh, change their mind, let's say a hundred years from now, and, and uh, does that mean the account of truth in the Bible is going to change a hundred years from now? Right. Isn't what they're really saying here, uh, does, doesn't it just mean that whatever the majority of scientists believe, uh, that's what truth is, not the Bible? You know, so what has more authority, the Bible or fallible human in, uh, interpretation? Yeah. I mean, that phrase doesn't mean anything if it's not based on what the plain reading of Scripture says. That's, that's sort of what it all comes down to, doesn't it? Right. Um, uh, one reviewer went on to say, Instead, he believes evolutionary creationism offers the greatest opportunity to bridge the gap and effectively end the culture war between faith and science if it can begin taking the Bible seriously enough. <laughs> but again, the problem is the Bible itself. The fact that scholars are devising alternate readings reveals the problem to say nothing of the implications of such reinterpretations. Right. Now, we're going to get to some of the implications in the next segment. Sure. But uh, here's a point I'd like to make. You know, throughout the, art, uh, the article, there's this emphasis on unity, right? Christians should be united. Yes. And, and we, we yeah. agree. You know, Christians hold to fundamentals uh, of the faith, and we should all do that, and we should, should all be united. But... Um, See, the point is, this is not like a denominational issue, right? All the different denominations of Christianity would, would hold to certain things, but they would all argue from the words of the Bible exactly. to say, yeah. well, this yeah. is why I hold to that view. This is why I hold to this view. But in this case, and we've seen it here from uh, openly, their own admission, their own admission yep. is that what they're doing is taking ideas from outside the Bible and then determining how they should interpret the Scripture. And they're the ones calling for unity. 
and they're the ones calling yeah. for unity. How can you have unity if, if it's not unified around one concept, the words of, uh, of, of what God's revealed That's to us? That's how unity is achieved, isn't it? Exactly. I mean, it, you, you, you look at Scripture and you draw them in. Everyone rallies around the truth of Scripture. Right. Then you have unity. So right. if 100 years from now, scientists determine some other way, uh, idea of, of origins, then truth is a constantly moving target. Right. And we'll get into this yeah. when we get back. For a long time, we've been told that human and chimp DNA is over 98% identical. But even though this figure has now been revised to 95% or less, does that mean that chimps are 95% human? Surprising as it may seem, 99% of mouse genes are present in human DNA, yet no one would consider a mouse 99% human. And humans also share about 50% of our DNA with bananas, but that doesn't mean we're half bananas. Humans are undoubtedly unique. An evolutionary scientist conceded this when he wrote a physical and mental chasm separates us from all other living creatures. There is no other bipedal mammal, no other mammal controls and uses fire, writes books, travels in space, paints portraits or prays. But the Bible tells us of the most distinguishing human characteristic of all. Humans are made in God's image and that makes us rather special. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website creation.com. Well, if you just tuned in today, we're talking about how theistic evolution uh, affects Christianity. Now, right. look at this popular uh, Christian magazine here. See the picture? Uh, it's from Christianity Today. And their depiction of Adam is like some kind of ape man. And then the, the tagline here uh, on the front cover says, Some scientists believe genome science casts doubt on the existence of the first man and woman. Others say the integrity of the faith requires it. You know, what are hmm. some of the implications here of, of theistic evolution? Well, yeah. one of them is that Adam wasn't a historical figure. It wasn't a real historical figure. It's right. just some kind of mythology. It came from ape men. Right? right. And, and you wrote a great article on this uh, on, our, our, on our website called uh, Biologos, Theistic Evolution and the Pelagian Heresy. Um, th this idea of debating a historical Adam and, and the destruction uh, uh, of the gospel. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you, can, you can read that, by the way, at creation.com slash biologos dash Pelagian dash heresy. So, so tell everybody here, I've read yeah. the article, but tell everybody, what, what is the problem of not believing in a historical the, Adam? It, it, the, the article focused on just one of the major theological issues with, with uh, theistic evolution, and that's if there's no historical Adam, it's as bad as the heresy of Pelagianism. Pelagius taught um, uh, many, many years ago that, um, that people are born with a blank slate. They're not born into sin. Right. And so if you're not born into sin, Pelagius argued that you can, you can choose God and you can, uh, you know, you, you, you're, you're completely free. Right. You're able to, able to do that. Well, Augustine argued that no, the reason we need a savior is because we are born as sinners. Right. We, are, we have a sin nature that we've inherited from Adam. Right. And actually, if you think of the virgin birth, uh, the reason we argue for a virgin birth is that Jesus did not inherit the sin nature from Joseph. Right. Otherwise, it would have disqualified him from uh, being uh, our savior. From being our savior. Yeah. But that's the basics of of the Pelagian heresy. And Biologos is arguing that there never even was a historical Adam. That's even worse than Pelagianism. So no saying historical that we didn't Adam. Inherit original sin. No original sin. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, even though many Christians would say that you know, belief in theistic evolution is not a salvation issue, uh, it certainly could be a salvation issue when, when you yes. push it to this yes. conclusion, right? You actually get into the, the point of heresy. I mean, if there's no original sin, what's Jesus saving us from? So, so it's, it's so important that uh, a, a famous uh, German Lutheran theologian, a prominent church historian, this guy knows a lot about church history, said, there, there has never perhaps been another crisis of equal importance in, the church, in church history in which the opponents have expressed the principles at issue so clearly and abstractly. The Arian dispute before the Nicene Council can alone be compared with it. So the Pelagian heresy was a big deal, and uh, we see Biologos making that same mistake today. Right. Um, I, I loved what you said in your article, and I'll, I'll quote you here. The astounding naivety with which some theistic evolutionists play around with the notion of no Adam is like a child who's found his dad's gun. Yeah. You know, <laughs> they toy with this concept seemingly without any idea that it will blow their heads off, literally, the head of the human race, and with it, the doctrine of original sin. <laughs> um, you know, Biologos, in, in response to the question, how does original sin fit with evolutionary history, they, they casually suggest that, Evolution does not raise questions about our current state of sinfulness. 
It does, however, raise questions about how and when the first sin occurred and how this fallen state was transmitted to all people. The sciences of evolution and archaeology can provide some insight into these questions, but are not equipped to answer them. These questions are theological, and over the centuries, the Church has considered many possible answers. Now, what those many possible answers are uh, isn't specified, right? Uh, but what this teaching doesn't allow is the view of the church throughout <laughs> history. That's what it doesn't allow. That's right. So if Adam's sin didn't lead to the condemnation for all men, then why should anyone believe that Jesus' one act of righteousness would lead, lead to the saving of all, of all people, the it, justification of all men? It says that Romans 5.18. That's right. So. You know, it seems like a, a prerequisite for theistic evolutionists is a very low view of Scripture, yeah. right? Yeah, it does. And, and particularly Genesis. And, and, and you can't really have a high view of Scripture while at the same time you, you mangle Genesis you know, to force fit evolution of millions of years into, uh, into this concept. So, yeah, that's a, and that's a serious issue with theistic evolution. A low view of Scripture, they, they mangle theology. I mean, it's, it's worse than the heresy of Pelagianism. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if you, if you don't even have a historical Adam, then you don't have original <laughs> sin. What on earth are we being saved from? What's Jesus saving us from? The whole thing falls apart, and there's big organizations out there promoting this to Christians. Creation Ministries International staff, many from a wide variety of scientific disciplines, have produced thousands of articles now available in a massive online database. Some of the topics covered include the feasibility of Noah's Ark and evidence for a global flood, scientific arguments that explain observations in astronomy within a young Earth time frame, recent discoveries that support dinosaurs fitting with biblical history, evidence from biology that shows that the type of change that is observed in living things has absolutely nothing to do with evolution. Got questions? Get answers at creation.com. On this week's episode, we're talking about how theistic evolution affects Christianity. Right. Now, theistic evolutionary groups like Biologos uh, claim that there's no evidence for Adam and Eve, and there's no physical way we could have uh, come from two ancestors in the recent past. Uh, as mentioned, uh, a high-profile uh, article, the, the Christianity Today article I mentioned there, yeah. uh, actually had this quote in it. Um, Collins 2006 bestseller, The Language of God, A Scientist Presents Evidence for Belief, reported scientific indications that anatomically modern humans emerged from primate ancestors perhaps 100,000 years ago, long before the Genesis time frame, and originated with a population that numbered something like 10,000, not two individuals. They also had this quote, In a recent pro-evolution book from InterVarsity Press, The Language of Science and Faith, Collins and co-author Carl W. Giberson escalate matters, announcing that, unfortunately, the concepts of Adam and Eve as the literal first couple and the ancestors of all humans simply don't fit the evidence. And Collins hasn't restricted himself to just the printed word. He's right. been saying things like this all over the country and around the world. Uh, for example, including a, a, a re in a recent address that he gave at Pepperdine University, he said this, there is no way you can develop this level of variation between us from one or two ancestors. Doing, uh, during an interview uh, that, uh, that he did on, on NPR, National Public Radio, he reiterated those claims, and uh, as did another Biologos uh, fellow, Dennis Venema, right. uh, and, and he said this, you would have to postulate that there's been this absolutely astronomical mutation rate that has produced all these new variants in an incredibly short period of time. Those types of mutation rates are just not possible. It would mutate us out of existence. Now we're going to examine that claim in the next segment, but right. you know, Biologos has basically thrown down the gauntlet here, yep. right? And, yep. and because of their status, uh, and Colin's status, for example, theistic evolution seems to have, you know, I mean, it used to be kind of a dismal place in the rear as far as the yeah, origin yeah. concepts from Christi Christians, but it's, it's perhaps in, in the forefront now uh, of what many Christians are accepting right. about uh, Genesis. Um, of course, not everybody's been convinced by the, the, the strength of their arguments. Um, in that same NPR uh, piece that you uh, quoted, Al Mohler, president of the uh, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, yes. pretty heavy hitter, uh, said, the moment you say we have to abandon this theology in order to have the respect of the word, world, you end up with neither biblical, biblical orthodoxy nor the respect of the world. You know, Moeller and others like him, of course, they're willing to stand in the face of, uh, you know, these, these 
challenges against uh, yep. plain reading of scripture. Yep. And, and I think that's because Dr. Moeller knows, you know, a lot more than the average person about the relationship between science and faith. Yes. Right? Yeah. And uh, he's certainly right about the lack of respect that, uh, you know, Christians receive when they, when they try to mix evolution with Christianity. Um, you can actually see the contempt coming from uh, arch theist, uh, or uh, atheist, atheist, I should say, yes. Richard Dawkins in this quote, he says, Oh, but of course the story of Adam and Eve was only ever symbolic, wasn't it? Symbolic? So in order to impress himself, Jesus had himself tortured and executed in vicarious punishment for a symbolic sin committed by a non-existent individual? As I said, barking mad as well as viciously unpleasant. <laughs> yeah, Dawkins doesn't really pull any punches there. No. Nope. Um, it, he's, it, he, he's, also, he's also said things like this. Yeah. I think the evangelical Christians have really sort of got it right in a way in seeing evolution as the enemy. Whereas the more, what shall we say, sophisticated theologians are quite happy to live with evolution, I think they're deluded. I think the evangelicals have got it right in that there really is a deep incompatibility between evolution and Christianity. Well, exactly. He, you know, Dawkins gets it. Yeah, like, the atheist. Yeah. Now, Moeller's right. You know, we don't see skeptics showing respect for compromise. And uh, next up, we're, we're going to actually... Um, I take Biologos' challenge here, uh, that, you know, that we're going to mutate ourselves out of uh, existence. We'll look at the that, genetics. That, and we'll look yeah. at that, and we'll look at what science is showing, and uh, see if their uh, challenge can stand up to close scientific scrutiny. All right. We'll be back. Is the human genome full of parasites? This might sound like a ridiculous question, but some biologists claim that it is. The Human Genome Project revealed that a large proportion of human DNA is composed of transposable elements. These DNA segments copy themselves and move around the genome. Some scientists have claimed they serve no function and have dismissed them as parasitic DNA. Evolutionists even claim that similarities with chimps in these supposedly useless bits prove evolution. But new research shows they have functions. One study revealed that transposable elements activate during embryo development in mice to control gene expression. Another study showed that these elements concentrate in gene-dense regions to control gene expression. They are not randomly spread throughout the genome as previously thought. So the human genome isn't full of parasites after all, but it's full of sophisticated ways to control gene expression. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. So our subject today is how theistic evolution affects Christianity. Right. Now, as mentioned, uh, one of the arguments from Biologos is that there hasn't been enough time to accumulate the mutations to create the amount of genetic variation found amongst uh, people today yes. if we came from Adam and Eve in the, in the biblical time frame. That's why they argue against what the Bible plainly says. Uh, however, this assumes that Adam, uh, Adam and Eve, they had no genetic variation, no yeah. heterozygosity, right. Uh, to start with, which is ridiculous. It is. It, it's yeah. a priori. We're just going to assume that's not true, right? So all sexually reproducing or organisms contain their genetic information in paired form. So each offspring inherits half of its genetic information from its mother and half from its father. So there, there's, there's two genes at, every, at any given position, you know, coding for a particular characteristic. So uh, an organ organism can be heterozygous, right? It means at, at a given uh, Locus meaning it, it carries different uh, forms or alleles uh, of, 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 of this gene. Uh, so you can have an allele for, um, you know, code for blue eyes or one that codes, codes for brown eyes. Right. Uh, yeah. you, know, you can have the A blood type or the B blood type, yeah. this kind of thing. And sometimes two alleles can uh, have a combined effect, right? Uh, while at other times only one allele, uh, the dominant one, has any effect on the organism, um, while the other doesn't. So um, just with that information there, if you start with that concept that if Adam and Eve did have uh, a variation, we can make some conclusions here. Yes. Right? Yeah. Now, it, it, uh, it, it, saying that Adam and Eve had, had no variation, <laughs> is it, that's like using evolutionary assumptions to prove evolutionary assumptions. Right. It's really bad argumentation. There's no reason to believe that God wouldn't have started Adam and Eve off with a huge amount of variability 
in their DNA to begin with in, right. in the first place. I mean, that would be expected. Yes. And yet they just blow that out of, out of the water. Yeah. Uh, and of course, later, later on, uh, factors like programmed variation and genetic mutations could have occurred after the fall, and that would have added even greater variation. Right. I mean, how much created diversity could we expect in the first couple, right? One way of estimating this is to look at the number of alleles shared amongst world populations. And the International HapMap Project is an organization that aims to develop a haplotype map um, hence HapMap, right. uh, of yep. the human genome, uh, which will describe the common patterns of human genetic variation. Uh, haplotype means a combination of closely linked DNA sequences on, on a chromosome that are often inherited together. So, for example, by comparing haplotypes of a mother and father uh, with, with those of their baby, for example, you, scientists can determine how new genetic changes might, might arise, for example. An analysis of the HapMap data uh, to measure the amount of heterozygosity within individuals revealed a global average of 4.33, um, plus or minus 0 0.234, <laughs> okay. times 10 to the fifth heterozygous alleles per person. That is a huge, huge figure. And thus approximately 30% of all HapMap uh, alleles are heterozygous within each person. So if there's 10 million common variants, a single individual would be expected to carry upwards of three or four million heterozygous alleles. And it could be expected that Adam had about 10 million or more uh, heter heterozygous okay. uh, loci, yep. and that each of his children had uh, half that much. All right, so some of these alleles however, would have been added uh, to the population through mutation. Right. And that, that happens. Uh, we understand mutations, of course, as creationists. How much genetic diversity is due to mutation? Well, you can look at some figures here. With the average modern generation time of 30 years, there have been only about 150 or perhaps uh, around 200 generations in all of human history since Adam, since creation and the flood in Babel, assuming a conservative modern estimate of 100 new mutations per person per generation, that gives us between 15 to 20,000 mutations per person. This is still a huge number when added up across the world population. Still, only a small fraction, less than 0.01% of heterozygosity is due to mutation. Right. So it's disingenuous for biologists to claim no evidence for Adam and Eve for several reasons. Um, you can look up more information on our website, of course. We've just chosen one of their, their objections here. But first, their conclusions are based on evolutionary assumptions. This is their whole thrust. We're evolutionists so that we're going to determine what the Bible s says because of it. But if you, if you just start with what the Bible says, you're not going to come to their conclusions. Yes. You, know, you yeah. can't legitimately claim something to be proven without uh, testing those assumptions behind the, that, that claim. So, because if, if you do, then it's just circular reasoning, right? You just, yeah. just question yeah. begging and yeah. it's just, you know, if you just reject an, uh, an alternative theory, creation, uh, out of hand, then, you know, it's just a straw man argument. And, you know, secondly, when you do look at the data, it actually fits beautifully with a straightforward yes, biblical model. So, right, you start with a single couple uh, about 6,000 years ago with that massive amount of genetic information. You can divvy it up, th you know, through its Mendelian genetics. It's not a yeah, problem. Yeah. We should mention here uh, Rob Carter, one of our geneticists, his article, you can, you can just click the, have a look at the link on the screen. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's taken bio, the BioLogos challenge and, uh, and there's the genetic data, the HapMap data that we've been discussing here. Yeah, you know, Collins and BioLogos would do really well to just take the Bible as plainly written yes. and then look yes. at the, uh, uh, what they're going for. Now, for sure. uh, we've actually got a, a DVD here by uh, Dr. Carter. Carter, Carter called, yeah. Mitochondrial yep. Eve and the Three Daughters of Noah. So you can check out Dr. Carter's uh, um, article, as Richard mentioned, but you can also get this DVD, which is just fantastic. He, he's, he's involved in genetics. It, it's, it, he just does a great presentation showing how, yeah, from you know, the eight people that came off the ark, you could explain the you diversity. Get all the variability we have today. Yep. Just great. Yep. And uh, you can get this for 30% off. You just go to creation.com, go to the resource area, just punch in the code CMLME3DN, and you can get this DVD for 30% off and just give you a ton of information on what we're talking about here today. Genesis Verse by Verse is a Bible study tool available on CMI's website, designed to help pastors, students, and laymen alike study the book of Genesis like never before. And it's completely free. Simply look up any verse in Genesis 1-11 to or just scroll down the page. The center column provides links to articles that answer common questions pertaining to that verse and the topics that naturally arise from them. 
Visit creation.com to use it today. Welcome back. Uh, we're going to wrap this up with uh, a feedback that we Great. got. Uh, this feedback is uh, called, Why Do Christians Want to Defend Evolution? Well, that's the title that we've applied to we it. We applied to it, Why yeah. do Christians want to defend evolution? And here's what the, uh, the person wrote in. This is Andrew W. from Australia. He says, yep. Hi there. Now, I know that you don't exactly play nice with people like me, and then he labels himself as a theistic evolutionist. But I was curious as if we could, as if, if we could sit down and have a little chat anyway. Now, I'm only 19 years old, and I surely haven't seen everything that this world has to offer, but I happen to have a keen interest in genetics and biology, which led to my understanding of evolution and the logic behind it. Anyway, that was just for contextual information. So my question is, why am I not accepted by you as a Christian? I believe in Jesus, in a heaven and a hell, and that God created the world. The only difference is that I believe we got here differently to you. Most, if not all, Christian de denominations have accepted evolution and taken it in stride, but creationists seem unable to accept the concept, but from your Q&A section anyways, he says, seems like you admit the most basic concepts that build up to the topic of evolution, but you just have an aversion to that particular word. I mean, it's not in the Bible, so it's against your belief, but motor cars, telephones, and gravity weren't mentioned either, to my knowledge. He has in brackets, a little bit of sarcasm there. Yeah. So why the hatred? As the great Charlie Chaplin said, in the 17th chapter of St. Luke, it is written, the kingdom of God is within man, not one man or a group of men, but in all men. Right. So that's the feedback. Right, and Dr. Don Batten responded in, uh, earlier when he said theistic evolutionists or evolutionists. Yes. You know, like yeah. this. And uh, uh, actually, uh, Don responded and said, well, you know, thanks for making contact. And he said, firstly, I don't know a speaker within uh, CMI uh, that, that cause, calls evolutionists evolutionists, uh, though he yeah. said he had heard of somebody that said something like that. And uh, of course, he, he said, you know, I too have a keen interest in genetics and biology because Dr. Batten is a, he's biologist, a biologist and he's got a PhD, <laughs> um, and, and, uh, which he said led to his understanding of evolution and the lack of logic behind it. So yes. you see, this emphasizes yeah. again, here you've got a PhD and, and a fellow who's studying science as well. They're looking at the same facts, yeah. but Don can and see because of the interpretations uh, yeah. there and that... Many of our scientists started off as evolutionists and yep. it's through examining the data that they changed their minds. It's not being blind to it. That's right. Now one of the things that Andrew brought up, you know, is we, we don't accept him and, and, and things like that. Yes, we often yes, see this kind yeah. of emotive language when people are responding to our ministry uh, or one of our videos or something like this, but we need to emphasize this is a brother in Christ. If he's professed yeah, Christ yeah. as his Savior, that's the definition of a Christian and we're accepting of, uh, of Christians. Absolutely. You're not going to find that on creation.com. We're not accepting of it. There's about 10,000 articles there. Have a look at all of them. Yeah. We, 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 and see if we don't accept that. Christians. That's not right? what we're saying. What we're saying is it's inconsistent yes. to take this position. And yes. we believe that. And of course, that's what we're going to defend. But it's, it's not really, uh, we've had this happen a couple of times, and it's kind of disingenuous to accuse us of something we're not doing. Right. Right? Yeah. So we just want to make that point uh, to Andrew and to anybody else out there that's doing this. Want a free copy of Creation, um, Creation Magazine? Yes, digital copy. Yeah, just go to creation.com, punch in the coupon code CMLFREEMAG, and you can get some more information. See you next time.